Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. So Graham has given you the title. Um, so I had buck teeth and uh, I didn't have braces because I wanted to play my trombone and if I had braces I wouldn't have been able to play my trombone. So I'm going to take you through a little journey through time and space and uh, I'm going to start with the impressionistic early years uh, and I'll talk a little bit about how our experiences influence our perceptions of time and space. And I think this is really important for understanding where we as humanity are right now with climate change. I'm going to give you four short vignettes on increasing time and space scales. Uh, and they're going to be uh, one on calcifying coccolithophores. I'll explain this as we go. One I call a line in the sea. One I call the great calcite belt. And then I'm going to end talking about the Mauna Loa curve in ocean acidification. Okay, so this is me at age 14. Uh, and, uh, and down in the corner, you can't read this, but it says library aids. And I was a library aide for Miss Myers, and uh, I was getting into a bit of trouble. I had put, uh, I thought it would be fun to put lobster bodies into her card catalog, <laughs> and, and in the back where no one would ever find them for a long time, and that indeed is what happened. And so I was doing penance here uh, as uh, reshelving books, and, uh, but my story begins here. And my story actually begins with this person here, Star Topinka Perkins, who is actually in the audience, and she was my ninth grade biology teacher. And she saw this young kid, and I was getting into some trouble, and, and I had told her that I was really interested in marine science. These were the days of Jacques Cousteau, and uh, I was fascinated by that. And there was this marine lab over, and this is in Rockport, Massachusetts. There's a marine lab over in, in Gloucester, uh, that I didn't know about, and she had some connections there. And she said, gee, well, maybe we could find something for you to do uh, after school. So I went over there and met with Charlie Yench, who was the director. That's his wife, Clarice. These are the two co-founders in the future of uh, Bigelow Laboratory. And this was my big break, my big break at 14 years old which pretty much determined the entire career trajectory up to now. And it's really scary when you think about this. And if there are young people out in the audience right now, take note. These things, when you get this break, you've got to take it. So here we were uh, at the UMass Marine Station. So single building here, and uh, it was in pretty bad shape when they started the research vessel uh, Bigelow was right here, and then they had another vessel here that they were given, and then they, they sold it to make more money to do the conversion for this. And after school, I was going there three days a week uh, to count phytoplankton cells under a microscope and maybe do some chlorophyll extractions. Now, there's a little side story here, because when I first went in to meet with Charlie Inch, uh, I, didn't, I was a pretty small kid. I didn't have my growth spurt till I was about 26 years old. And, and when I was sitting in Charlie's office, my feet were dangling. They weren't even touching the floor. And I was petrified. I, and he said, well, Barney, what would you like to do here? <clears throat> Why are you here? And I said, uh, I'd, I'll do anything. I'd like to work in a marine lab. I'll empty waste baskets. I'll do, I'll do anything. And he said, well, no, we have somebody to, to empty waste baskets but can you count? And I said, sure. And he said, well, I've got all these cultures that we need to have someone look at and take regular measurements of how many cells there were. And he said, but I've got this problem. <clears throat> he said, I, uh, you're too young, at 14 years old, you're too young to be employed by the University of Massachusetts. And I was crestfallen. I thought that was it. Uh, so I'm going to be routed out on some administrative thing. And he said, ah, no, he said, I've got it. I s he said, we're going to make you a company. And I said, really? And he said, yep, <laughs> we're going to call you Balch's Visual Aids. And your, <coughs> your checks will come to Balch's Visual Aids. And, and just so you know that I'm not lying, actually, 
let me skip through these. Oh, there we go. There is an original invoice made out to the vendor, Balch's Visual Aids, from Charles S. Yench for $30.80. Now, that, that was in 1978, so that's the, after seven years, they were still giving me checks to Balch's Visual Aids. And I go into the bank, and I was a short kid, and I'd hand the check up to the teller, and the teller would look over, and she'd say, are you sure these, this isn't your father's check? And I said, no, I, it's mine. So, so this, but this is Charlie. You, you had to know Charlie. This is pure Charles Yitch. OK, so really, this is about how one lucky break and a decision to follow it changed my very perception of space and time. So I've told you about this at the UMass Marine Lab, where I was looking at these 20 micron phytoplankton cells, 20 millionths of a meter. I didn't have a clue about these things. And then from when they moved up to start Bigelow Laboratory, I, I was fortunate enough to start going to sea with Charlie as a high school student. And you know we'd go out 1,000 kilometers out to sea. And, and he was telling me about green light, which had a wavelength of half a micron, 500 nanometers. I didn't know what this stuff was, but it was getting smaller and smaller. And then, because of Charlie, and uh, he wrote me letters of recommendation, I went out to work at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. And there we started working in the 3,000 kilometer California current, doing short-term nutrient transport experiments, where we'd look at how nutrients got taken up by phytoplankton, the fertilizer, on time scales of fraction, actually fractions of a second. And it was there that I learned about geological time scales and uh, paleontology, which would come back later. And then I went to do a postdoc at Scripps, where we started. This was the very beginnings of remote sensing. So the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, which was launched in 76, and by the time I was doing my uh, postdoc, we were seeing the very first images of the California bite from space. And, and the first image that they got, and they came running down the hall, and they said, you've got to look at this. And it, it, it still gives me chills to think about it. This is a very formative time. So a little bit more on changing perceptions, and then we'll get to some funny stories. Um, from there, I went to the University of Miami, where we started studying these massive blooms of phytoplankton in the North Atlantic that were half a million square kilometers that went from basically Newfoundland over to the Faroe Islands south of Iceland. I mean, we, it, it was amazing to be in these things. And then I became fascinated with the evolution of these things which took me way back um, 250 million years, was when these coccolithophores had first evolved. And then I came back to Bigelow uh, as, as a senior research scientist. I started working on viruses, these 20 nanometer particles, smaller than the wavelengths of light that I'd been working with. And from there, we also worked on this thing called the Great Calcite Belt, which covers 16% of the globe. It's a massive area of elevated coccolithophore concentration. And then we started doing a time series across the Gulf of Maine. We've done a, a hundred thousand, over 100,000 kilometers back and forth uh, across the Gulf of Maine on ferries and ships of opportunity. And in all of our expeditions, me and my wonder, the wonderful people that work with me, uh, we've done about a quarter million kilometers of transit through the world ocean. Now, this isn't to brag or anything. It's just to say that our space and time scales, the experiences that we have, very much affect our space and time perception. So, and this is the climate change part. So how to convey space and time to you all? And, and so I have this, this axis, these two axes here. One is time in seconds, starting at, this is only a, a millisecond here, 10 to the minus 2. And we're going to go out to 10 to the 12 seconds, which is 10, 000, over 10,000 years. And I put the, the common time increments here along the other side of that axis. And then on this axis is in meters. And we go from 10 to the minus 9, which is nanometers, up to 10 to the 9th, which is 100,000 kilometers. So the typical person, when they're born, they know their crib, and they're, uh, 
their time scales that they interact with us on are usually hours to days. I gotta pee, I gotta, I gotta sleep. Um, but when you're one, your space and time uh, perception is pretty slow, or pretty low. And then when you're five, you're starting, maybe you're thinking a week ahead, um, and in your spatial scale now is maybe up to a kilometer. Maybe you go out into the woods. And so you can follow this. So this is the age I was when I first met Charlie. And think, you know, maybe I was thinking a month ahead, and, uh, and I still wasn't thinking of very short time scales. And uh, spatial scales, you know, I rode my bike down to the restaurant to, to wash dishes. By the time I was 30, you know, I was thinking ahead a year. I had their kids coming, and, uh, and, but I really wasn't still thinking that far ahead. And then when you're 90, you know, you're, you've experienced almost a century here. And, you know, you're, you're of course, familiar with these shorter time scales. But this is just to, to ex show how uh, our perceptions of space and time. This would be for a, your typical person. But then I come to Bigelow, I work, start working with Charlie Yench. So here I was at 14, and by the time I was 18, you know, we're down into these shorter time scales. And by the time I was 24, you know, I was interested in these very short time scales of how nutrients went into phytoplankton. And, and now we're looking at multi-year time series. And now at 30, you know, we are still even shorter time scales and bigger spatial scales out here. And I'm actually over 50 now, but uh, you know, it's, it's really a wonderful opportunity in Earth science. And that's one of the cool things, if there's anyone here thinking about going into the field of Earth science, that it really forces you to think of long time scales and long spatial scales, big spatial scales. So now, <coughs> my formative years. I've learned how science was really done. And, and this may look to you like a piece of graph paper, but no, it's not. This is a placemat for the thistle inn. And business, <laughs> business at the thistle was done in the very early, early days of Bigelow. Everyone went to lunch at the thistle, and the owner of the thistle got so fed up with all the doodlings on pieces of paper that she made a placemat and she put in the corner the Thistle Institute for Ocean Sciences. <laughs> and there are a few of these placemats that still exist. But this is where ideas happen. People would sit around the table and bat around ideas. It was a fantastic experience for me. I was too young to drink beer, but it was still a great experience to learn about what was going on. And another great break, uh, Patrick Holligan, who came to be a guest at the laboratory in 1979, uh, and we all lived in the same house out on, on Southport at Cape Newhagen. And he would go on to become the director of Bigelow Laboratory. But he, he was a very big thinker. And, how, and he thought in large scales and also in small scales of space and time. So with, with Patrick and Charlie Yinch, uh, we went out to the Celtic Sea in 1980. And uh, that was on a British research vessel. But, Fantastic experience. Then off to Scripps, and this is really where my space-time perceptions got rearranged, more than at the Thistle Inn. And uh, so this was the class in, in 1980, and another one of uh, life's finite number of breaks uh, in the class a year later was Patty Matry, who I was then to meet up with over the lab bench and later on got married had kids. And so one of the things, and this is, this is one of the few science pieces I'm going to show you here. Um, we talked a lot about space and time scales. And this is called a Stommel diagram. It's, it's named after Hank Stommel, the very famous uh, physical oceanographer, who really taught us all how to think about processes in space and time. And, and it's just like that, the, 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 the graph I showed you before, except now this has a third axis. It's in the vertical direction. And that's the, in, for this one, it's the variability of zooplankton biomass. And so the people that did this particular plot, Howry et al. in 1978, it goes back, but it, there's, a, there's so much in here. 
They were interested in things like micro patches of plankton, swarms of zooplankton in this region here, which happened here is on a daily time scale and at this uh, uh, distance, uh, uh, length scale of, of 10 to the 5 uh, centimeters and so forth on out to ice age variations where you see there's massive variability, more variability at the long space and time scales than there is at the short space and time scales. And they also embedded in here how we learn about the ocean through things like moorings. That's this gray area right here. When you put a mooring out, these are the space and time scales that you can cover. Or when you have a satellite, these are the space and time scales that you can cover, multi-year uh, and scales out to 10,000 kilometers. And uh, ships, which are uh, this sort of this gray line right here, they cover other time scales in, sp in uh, space and time scales. So it's to say that there's no silver bullet for studying the ocean. You need all three of these things to understand the variability that's going on. So here's a not so lucky break, and actually a lucky break that we didn't sink. Uh, this was my first cruise as chief scientist and, and where I learned about the hard realities of life at sea. This is a vessel that collided with us in the middle of the night uh, and left its collision bow on, on our deck and fortunately nobody was killed. But you know, these are the sorts of lessons when this happens to you, um, it's a life changing experience and uh, we, we as I said, there are no casualties, thank God. So coccolithophores, these are these plankton that calcify. They produce little tiny scales, and this is, this is an image of a coccolith. It's a, a scale that's two millionths of a meter in diameter, but this one is 250 million years old. So this came out of the sediments, and you're looking at it from a scanning electron micrograph. And, and of course, we were attracted to this because of the smiley face, but um, and, but here, here are some uh, views of living coccolithophores that we're studying now. And they come in various shapes and sizes. Look at these beautiful trumpet shapes here. Uh, and there are all sorts of questions about why they make these plates, what is the evolutionary role of these plates, what's the future of these organisms in an acidifying ocean where, they have, where the ocean is getting more acid and they're having a harder time calcifying. And just to take you back to uh, a little bit of evolution here, the white cliffs of Dover, which is in the background, this is all made up of foraminifera ooze and coccolis, nothing but these tiny calcium carbonate plates. And Thomas Huxley, who was known as uh, Darwin's bulldog, and he was president of the Royal Society, he gave public lectures, kind of like this. One was called On a Piece of Chalk, and it was basically buttressing what Darwin was uh, uh, teaching everybody about evolution, because all that history was trapped in the cliffs, white cliffs of Dover. So the discovery of mesoscale blooms of coccolithophores, mesoscale, which meant uh, over uh, very large scales, by Holligan in 1983 really changed the way people thought about these organisms. This was uh, before he was director, this was, uh, but after he had come over uh, to start work at Bigelow. And this is from a nature paper, and what he saw, it doesn't look like much now, but it was a very crude image. He saw these high reflectance features, here's France and England, off of the Western European continental sh uh, shelf. And when he went out there in a boat, got his hands wet and looked at the material, this is a, a fecal pellet of a marine insect, a zooplankter, that's packed with these coccolis, these calcium carbonate plates. And so this was the first inkling that these blooms, such blooms existed, large blooms. And then in 1988, uh, we were actually up here, I was at the University of Miami at the time, but we were up here in the summer, and we didn't have the coastal zone color scanner because Congress couldn't get their act together to get funds appropriated. And so we have an 11 year hiatus where we had no imagery of the phytoplankton of the earth. And so we used an, an, a, uh, uh, the AVHRR, the Advanced High Resolution Radiometer, had one very crude channel in it that we could actually 
used to look at this very high reflectance feature out in the middle of the Gulf of Maine. We didn't know what it was, but we called up uh, the Navy, actually, and we said, there's this huge 100,000 square kilometer feature out there. Could we get a couple of days of ship time? And so in that cruise, we made the first observations uh, of a mesoscale coccolith for in the Gulf of Maine. We used this satellite, and it was the first time we measured the carbon fixation. So how do these things relate to the carbon cycle? So that was our cruise track. And this is a, a rather old photograph. I was wearing a navy blue uh, jacket here. And you see the, the lighter color of the water. That was navy blue. That's Jeff Brown right there, old employee of Bigelow. Here's another picture. That's Patrick Holligan, Steve Ackelson, who was also at the laboratory. And they're looking out at this turquoise color, co colored water, which is full of calcium carbonate coccolis. And that's what we saw when we filtered the water. OK, vignette number two. A line in the sea is what I call this. And, and I'm going to take you back in time. Uh, 1992, the O.J. Simpson trial was uh, uh, still in, in just getting going, actually. And we were involved in a cruise which uh, the space shuttle, let's get a closer view of this. This is the tail of the space shuttle. And they were looking back at the Pacific Ocean at a line right there that crossed the entire Pacific. And this, this picture made the cover of Nature. And it was an extraordinary feature. And they, they, tell, they communi communicated back, you know, geez, check this thing out. We happened to be out there. And we were steaming a line down towards Tahiti. And uh, so now I'm going to show you this from a couple of different scales. Here is from the NASA P-3 aircraft, which was flying over the uh, one side, on one side of this. And you see how green that water is. And this was a bloom. It was clearly a bloom of phytoplankton on one side. A little bit closer. Now, this is the ship's radar. Now, in the ship's radar, which is pretty high up, you could actually see a line. There was no brick wall that we knew of. It looked like we were about ready to run into the coast. But there was this line. And it was quite close, as you can tell. We're, we were sitting right at the edge, at the middle of that radar screen. And everyone's up there looking. What the heck is this thing? So now we're getting closer. And now we're about 100 meters away from this line in the sea that covers the entire uh, Pacific Ocean. And you can see a frothy boundary there. And it's greener on one side than it is on the other. And then as we cross that line into the greener side, it's a little harder to see it once you're in it. And this is what it was from. This is a giant diatom called Rhizosalinia castorinii. It was 200 microns across and about a millimeter in length, each cell. You could see these with the naked eye. You didn't even need a microscope. And this thing is very buoyant. And there were two major ocean currents that ba uh, ocean boundaries that collided with each other there. And right at that boundary uh, were what were called planetary Kelvin waves. And these, that line in the sea actually waved back and forth. And there was convergence of water at that boundary, and these floating cells actually converged right at that spot. It was just an amazing sight. And that little thing right there is a protozoa that would burrow into those cells and start to eat them from the inside out. So it's a jungle out there. That's another lesson of this. <laughs> okay? And this is what these cells look like under epifluorescence. You, make, you shine them with blue light, and they fluoresce red from the chlorophyll that they contain. But crossing that line is harder work than you might appreciate. So here we are crossing the line for the first time, the equator crossing in the Pacific, just after we had crossed that line. Uh, we had to cross the equator, and, and uh, we were initiated uh, into the rites of Neptune. Uh, and here we are. That's David Finney. And Dave and I had spent a lot of time getting rid of the ship's garbage before we crossed the line, because we knew that we were going to have to swim through it if we didn't. And when they found out that we had gotten rid of a lot of the garbage, they gave him the first necklace of fish heads, and I was about ready to get the second when this photo was taken. And of course, we had to go through the Tunnel of Love. And this is, you see this gentleman here with the garbage from the ship, and there, I, yours truly was swimming through it 
it's not that bad. Um, and here I am post, and uh, that was uh, before I washed the coffee grounds off. OK, change channels. So now I'm in the North Atlantic, and this was in 1991. Um, this was this coccolithophore bloom that covered the entire North Atlantic. Now we're, we're dealing with space and time scales that were pretty foreign to me. And uh, the Faroe Islands is off the screen here. Uh, Newfoundland is off the screen there. You can see Iceland. And these are a series of images. We still didn't have an ocean color sensor for this. But these are all strung together. And you can watch this thing evolve. You can watch these eddies full of this calcium carbonate soup. It's like the dandruff of the ocean spinning up. And there's lots of biology going on in there. So in, again, here's uh, the same gentleman here, Charles Trees. I had him pose in this picture with the same jacket with the navy blue. So this is outside the bloom. This is inside the bloom. You can see the color difference. While most of us were looking down, others were looking up. And this, we were just south of Iceland, and there was a, uh, a jet crossing from Glasgow uh, over to the US. And we thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we could contact that pilot and see, get an idea of what it looked like from 38,000 feet. So we called up the flight, and uh, it turned out to be a Lufthansa flight. And so there's this very German sounding captain. And we, we said, uh, excuse us, you know, we're calling on an emergency frequency. Could you look out the window, please? Because this is usually the time of the flight where they're taking a nap, right? It's the long stretch across the Atlantic. And, and so you, you could hear him you know, jacking his seat up. And as soon as he looked out, there's this, this, you know, uh, 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 this German exclamation. I don't know what it was, but wow, this is incredible. I've never seen anything like this. And we said, could you uh, take a picture of this and send it to us? This is before 9-11. Uh, and he, didn't, he said, I don't have a camera, but let me radio back into the cabin. So he radioed back into the cabin, and someone back there had a camera. And they brought them up into the cockpit. And they took this picture of the feature from 38,000 feet. And this is what they saw. So this is one of those eddies. We're this, uh, we figured we're that little dot right there. And, but you see one of these swirls and where the concentration of these coccolithophores was greater. And we were doing, in the process of doing a transect right through that thing. OK, kids come along, and they, as you all know, they really change your sense of space and time. And uh, I'm, you know, this isn't anything special except that they're my kids, right? And uh, this is 1990 and 1994, and uh, life was different forever after. And the break, 14, it went, at 14 years, came full circle when my wife and I moved back up to Bigelow from the University of Miami. And uh, we didn't want to raise our kids down there. This is a great place to be, and a great laboratory to be. And and I. I am so fortunate to have a lab family, uh, which these, these folks have been with me for a long time. Now, here is a very young David Drapeau, and we were putting together, this is Lisa Graziano, a postdoc. We we're putting together an underway system to take to sea for the first time. Uh, and here's the team. So I, I alluded to the fact that we run a time series. We've been going back and forth on ferries. We have uh, NASA helped us build this laboratory container, which is on the back of a flatbed truck. It's a complete optical laboratory that allows us to uh, go aboard the ferry and do real oceanographic measurements. And there's Bruce Bowler, Amanda Ash, who's at the University of Maine, and David Drapeau. And here we are, the first time we plug the van into the ship. And let me tell you, you know, it had a UPS, a ship's UPS system in there, and lots of things had to work up just right in order to get phase and polarity and everything, but the lights turned on and we were doing a thumbs up. That was a big moment. So <coughs> this time series, the 36-year Gulf of Maine North Atlantic time series, or I call it NATS, and we, we've, there are data in there from Charlie Inch, Dave Finney, Carl Boyd from Dalhousie, NOAA, that have allowed us to extend this backwards. We didn't really start doing our measurements until 1998, but with theirs, uh, their observations as well, we're actually able to look at longer time scales 
of things like temperature and salinity. And this is an article in the Boston Globe, and, and people would ask, why don't you get bored going back and forth along the same line over and over? And I say, yep, it's true, except that's where you get the statistical power to understand the system. Uh, so we've witnessed a massive 500% drop in the Gulf-wide primary productivity since 2007. That's if there's one thing that has come out of this, it's very dis uh, disconcerting, is the fact that this dropped so much, and I'd be happy to talk to you about possible reasons for that uh, later. Uh, and then I mentioned the virus work. We, you know, uh, we have folks at the lab now, uh, uh, Willie Wilson and Joaquin, um, who are working on viruses. We were doing this work in, in the 90s, looking at the optical properties of marine viruses. And how were, could you actually see an optical signature of these? And what, uh, what did they look like? And what we discovered was that these marine viruses could make a turbid phytoplankton bloom gin clear in, a, in the scale of an hour. Now, from people who work with viruses, that's probably not a big surprise. But from an ocean optics perspective, when you're trying to understand the time scales at which a bloom changes, that's a big deal because it, these things clarify the water. And, and they do have very important consequences to light. Uh, let me back this thing there. Uh, the Great Calcite Belt, this region down here covers 16% of the global ocean, as I alluded to earlier. And uh, this is from Coccolis. And we've done several cruises down here in the Atlantic and the Indian sectors showing that it's Coccolis. And, um, the ramifications of this material is enormous because calcium carbonate is limestone. It's very dense. And this stuff can fuel the sinking of particulate matter down to the bottom of the sea. And, and it fuels what is essentially the ocean biological carbon pump. So this, this feature down here has huge biogeochemical importance. I'm gonna, my last vignette here is about Charles David Keeling, who was at Scripps when I was there. Um, he's gone now, but he started uh, basically working on the ultimate space-time problem, and that is CO2-induced climate change. And y I'm sure many, if not all of you, have seen this. Uh, he started in the 50s, and then uh, Noah took it over later as he got older, and, and they've run it henceforth. And there are some aspects of this that were really fascinating. There are these, if you take the mean, you can see that the slope was increasing over time. So this is on top of the Mauna Loa Observatory uh, out of Hawaii. And he would go up there, I don't know, weekly, and they would open up an evacuated uh, um, ball, a glass ball. They would collect the air, and then they would take it back, and they me measure the stable isotope ratio, um, the amount of CO2 in there. But there were some very fundamental questions about why is this line jiggling like it is? And so there were all sorts of thoughts about, well, maybe this is related to economics. And so the International Monetary Fund uh, derives the real gross domestic product here as, uh, as for, a, for a global recession they say that when the real GDP of the globe is less than 3%, then it's a recession. And, and these are the periods in red where there have been these recessions. And then IMF came along in 2009, and they, they redefined it as a decline, a recession, as a decline in the annual per capita real world GDP, gross domestic product. And those are the greens. So they, they don't exactly agree when the recessions were. But the thing to note is there's a, a flatter part here. There's a little jog there. There's a little jog there. But there's another way to, to look at this. People also said, yeah, but there are volcanoes going off. Uh, Mount Chichon in 82, which is actually a pretty small volcano. Mount Agung in 1963. And the, the second largest volcanic eruption in the 20th century was Mount Pinatubo in 1991. And here, actually, the CO2 flattened out. It actually slowed down. Uh, so there's some, and uh, there, there is some co-occurrence here of volcanic eruption and 
and world uh, recessions, hard to say if they're related or not, but um, as, as the aside, the lengths of the global economy to the atmospheric CO2, this gentleman down here, Granados, published a paper just recently. It's fascinating that the changes in the world GDP have a significant effect on CO2 concentrations so that the years of above trend world gross domestic product are years of greater rise of CO2 concentration. Measuring the WGDP in constant US dollars, 2000, for each trillion dollars deviates from the trend, the atmospheric CO2 concentration deviates from the trend in the same direction about half a part per million. Remember, we're up to 400 parts per million now. And finally, CO2 atmospheric levels would be based on the known fact that most activities generating value added to WGDP also imply combustion, which is. So the best way to show all that is actually the plot from his paper, uh, in which in red is the annual change in CO2 emissions here, and in gray is the growth in WGDP. Uh, and that's in trillions of 2,000 US dollars. And you can see that they don't align exactly, but there are certainly some peaks here that are co-occurring. So, and, and he argues, yes, there are, can be convulsion factors, like the temperature, and that may be very difficult to get a, uh, to, to deconvolve, but this is pretty interesting evidence. So, not all man's CO2 has stayed in the atmosphere. Almost half of it has disappeared. Of the 46%, it stays in the atmosphere. 29% is taken up by terrestrial biosphere, and 26% by the ocean. So the oceans have helped to mitigate uh, CO2 climate change. So we're at 400 parts per million. The current estimates are for 900 parts per million by 2100, with the business as usual scenario. And the amount of CO2 in the ocean is expected to double the pre-industrial levels in the next 50 years. And when you add CO2 to water, it makes carbonic acid acidifying the sea, which is not good if you're a shell former. So here's the same Mauna Loa curve from and out at Station Aloha. They're measuring the CO2 in the water. And you notice these are the same units. Notice that the slopes are equal. And also, this is pH here in green, and you can see the pH is going down over the 20 years. It's small, but it's going down. So even in Maine, ocean acidification is getting some press. And in fact, there's some legislative committees that are just now forming to look at this problem. And before I end, um, this is a time scale. Uh, uh, there are there's a long time scale here, and this is pH, that has been estimated from different techniques, cores, uh, and seawater samples, all that stuff here, ice cores. And uh, this is from a paper by Pelajero in 2010. And all I want you to see is, so all the pH measurements at Station Aloha that I just showed you are right here, okay? That's uh, in this time period here. This goes out to 2100. And this scale goes back to the Devonian. And I'm showing you this because the little movie I'm about ready to show you doesn't go back that far. It only goes back to about 600,000 years. Um, but you, if you look at a long time series of pH, since about 20 million years ago, before present, okay, that's uh, in the Miocene, uh, pH has been 8.2. And now we are taking it back down. The last time, and, and the projections are that it's going to go down to 7.8. Um, the last time we saw 7.8 pH was in the Jurassic. It, that's in the ocean. Uh, that's during the dinosaur time. And then we saw it a few other times. It got way down to 7.5 uh, here in the Jurassic. And in the Triassic, it went up again, and it came back, and it was low in the Devonian. So, you know, these sort of perturbations that I'm talking about on a geological time scale are enormous. And so how the organisms in the, o in the ocean adapt to this is the big question. So, now I'm going to show you, beg your indulgence, a little movie. There we go. 
OK, so this is called the pump handle movie. It lasts a couple of minutes. And um, this is the concentration of CO2 in the globe. And the date is right here. Here's 1979. And out everywhere you see dots there are where measurements were made. So the northern hemisphere is on this side. The southern hemisphere is here. You notice a lot more variability in the northern hemisphere. That's because there's a lot more land with trees that are sucking up the CO2 in the summer and they're uh, respiring in the winter. So in the winter is when the CO2 goes up in the northern hemisphere. And down in the southern ocean, this is in, in the Antarctic, where that blue dot is right there, it's pretty much keeping track. It just doesn't show the, the massive vacillations here. Now, here is the time, the, the time course. We're up to 95. And uh, so Mauna Loa passes 350 ppm in 1989. And you see the trends are basically, it's going one way uh, in the southern hemisphere. And there's very good uh, uh, agreement between these measurements within the southern hemisphere. Uh, and up it goes. Now, when this goes, these are the NOAA data that are being shown right now. And then they're going to start extending these backwards. So you get the idea where this is going. You see their ship tracks here, for example, where they were making measurements uh, of CO2 in the atmosphere. OK, so now we're going to start working backwards through these are Keeling's observations. And uh, after Keeling's observations, then they're going to get into ice cores and other geological course. So now we're back to 1958. Uh, and there, there we go. OK, so here are some cores now, uh, some ice cores showing that now we're down to 280 uh, parts per million. And we're back to five, uh, this is the year uh, 500, for example, right there. Now they're extending the scale. Now we're going back. Uh, so we're 5,000 years uh, before Christ, and here is 25,000 years. And now we're, you see about 200 parts per million, 60,000 years, 100,000 years. OK, there's a cycle right there. 200,000 years, there's another little blip. Now we're getting back to these Milakovic, Milakovic cycles where uh, an yet another geological cycle and, and ice ages. And now we're back to 800,000 years uh, before Christ. And we, were, we never really got above 300. So you can see the sort of perturbation uh, that's involved. And these are all the people that are responsible for this amazing movie. In the business of Earth science, time and series observations can change the way we perceive the world. And, and Keeling is certainly an example of that. I'm going to leave you with a couple of thoughts. And uh, Louis Agassiz, who was a great naturalist from 1807 to 1873, he said, every scientific truth goes through three states. First, people say it conflicts with the Bible. Next, they say it has been discovered before. And lastly, they say they always believed it. <laughs> That's by Louis Agassiz. And he also said, study nature, not books. And in, to any young scientists out there, uh, life gives you a finite number of breaks. Take them. You never know where they'll take you and how long until the next. Expand your horizons in time and space. The world needs young scientists who can think beyond political time scales and domestic borders. In the world of climate change, everything is connected. So the lower salinity we're seeing in the Gulf of Maine now is probably associated with a melting ice cap. And finally, and I just stuck this in because uh, I don't know if anyone was following this, but NASA was uh, this morning was supposed to launch the OCO2 uh, sensor, which was a follow-on from the OCO1, which crashed and burned. It did not make it into orbit, and so they, they uh, basically took the plans, updated them a little, and made a new one that cost five years. 
Um, it was supposed to launch this morning. Now it's, they're saying it's going to launch at 5.56 Eastern Daylight Time tomorrow on July 2nd. You can watch the launch on NASA TV. Uh, just go on the web and you'll see it. It's pretty cool. And keep your fingers crossed. And I'd like to thank my lab family over the years. You know, uh, these are people that go way back with me till Miami, postdocs, students, uh, technicians, uh, research associates. Uh, none of the stuff that we do could be done without these very hardworking and wonderful people. And, uh, and this family, the Greater Bigelow family, which uh, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. So uh, thank you very much. And these are the foundations that support us. Thank you.